Welcome to Common Ground Storytelling. I am Cheryl Peralt, the host of our program. This is a monthly new program of true stories to bring us together. And it has come about on HCAM TV because I used to host true storytelling in cafes and community art spaces. And we can't do that right now. So we have the opportunity to do so on Zoom and live stream uh, through HCAM TV, which I am grateful for. So uh, this has gotten started by recruiting people to ask, asking them to tell a story, a true story from their life or observations on a particular theme for five minutes or less. And, um, the, and these are stories that are intended to bring people together. And um, I think it's pretty simple uh, guidelines other than that. So I have been able to get folks out from community in the area here of Hopkinton and beyond to send in pre-recorded stories. And then we also are inviting the storytellers into our gallery space so that they can talk with you this evening about their stories and about themselves. We can get to know them more uh, as we watch their recorded stories. So we are ready to get rolling and uh, we have 10 community storytellers on board this evening. And the theme of this month is all you need is love. So let's sit back in our chairs and get ready to hear some diverse stories uh, from community and see what folks have to say about this theme. So I'd like to begin tonight in getting ready to show our stories and meet our community storytellers to invite Joy Seidler to join. Um, Joy, hello. Hey, Cheryl. Ah, I hear your voice. Good to see you. Now, uh, Joy, I will tell you a little about her. Joy is my friend and recently just uh, is recovering from uh, knee surgery, right? Uh, and so I really appreciate that you're agreeing to be a part of this program tonight. How are you doing? Thank you, Cheryl. I'm uh... I didn't realize I had expectations, but I apparently did. And I'm doing much better than whatever they were. I'm oh. doing really well. So That's thank you. To hear. Well, for uh, those of you who don't know Joy, uh, Joy is an educator, and I would say an excellent educator who is very inspiring as well, a healer, an artist, a lover of Sophia, and Joy endeavors to use art, ceremony, and story to plant seeds for right action so that in a time beyond our own, life can jump up and live. And I will add that, again, Joy is a wise and inspirational teacher. And years ago, Joy used to te teach art. And you are an artist and just wondered when we're talking about love, what do you love about art? would you say in maybe a nutshell? You know, in the original etymology of the word art, it means to join. Mm -hmm. And so in its best, most sacred dance, art is a, one of the ways that we connect, just as you connected us here at the beginning, Cheryl, with that beautiful poem. That's, it's that piece that I love about art. Yes, well, thank you. And um, I wanted to ask one more question. Your story, there is a character uh, with the name of Rosie Greer. And I don't want to give away too much, but I just wonder if folks don't happen to know that name. Is there anything you might want to say about that name? It would be helpful for the story to have a little background. So uh, Roosevelt Greer was a very famous National Football League player. He was born in the 1930s, one of 12 children in Georgia, um, did very well in sports, and then played on a couple of really big teams in the 50s. I don't really know football, but Giants and the Rams, considered part of the like best defensive. And he's a huge mountain of a man. And as a joke, 
after retirement, he began to crochet and then he began to knit and then he actually wrote a book. He's a really good human being. He, you know, back in the 70s, he had lots of organizations for urban youth. So he's somebody who gave back to the community. And he also helped us to see, you know, shift gender identity. Because here's this epitome of a macho man crocheting and knitting and writing books about it. And um, so that's Roosevelt Greer. All big, right. <laughs> big, black, fabulous guy. <laughs> Well, thank you for the background. And now we'll hear maybe another version of Rosie Greer uh, with your story. So greetings. Joy Seidler here um, on a snowy night yet again. February, we're getting late February. We're having yet more snow. And um, on this cold and snowy night, when the old man has settled himself down behind the western edges of our land. I am here to tell you about a love story about uh, one of my great teachers. Um, Roosevelt Greer was a cat. Roosevelt Greer was also a football player and that's who this black cat was named for. Um, Rosie is what we called him and uh, he I was fortunate enough to have him as a house companion during the 80s. But at one point, as often happens, he had gotten feline leukemia and he wasn't well. He was not well. He'd done that, stop eating, crawled off into a place in the basement that cats can do when they're getting ready to transition. And so grief stricken, but understanding that this might be his path, my partner at the time and I said, well, let's carry him outside. He loved the outdoors so much. And we brought him outside to a wood pile. And much to our amazement, this cat, which was showing no signs of life, began purring vehemently in a good way. And um, a little light went off in my head. And I thought, oh, I can do this. Um, in those days, I was teaching in an elementary school, and I would come home every day as quickly as I could. And remember, it's February then, too, and it was cold. Um, but I would get my sleeping bag, I'd dress myself warmly, and then I would get my down sleeping bag, and I would go across the street on an embankment overlooking a stream where Rosie loved to hunt. And um, I would put the sleeping bag with Rosie in it on my lap, and we'd sit there in the afternoon sun and he'd purr and I would meditate. And we that was our afternoon ritual. And at night, just before I went to bed, I'd go out in the backyard and, and I'd climb into the sleeping bag and he would snuggle down by my legs. I knew he was in there because I could feel a, the purr vibrating against, against uh, my thigh. And, um, and he got better. And what Rosie taught me was the power the, of the, the healing power of the natural world. Um, and probably also both of us, the healing power of love. Um, and uh, what else is there, there, is there to say about that? Well, he also taught me that I, at that a uh, busy time in my life wasn't spending enough time outside. So he reminded me of the importance of regular deep time in the natural world. And um, so Roosevelt Greer, the cat, he was a good one. And when he was a little kitten, he had been very active. So as, as sometimes happens, the uh, muscles near their belly kind of get loose. And he had he had some pounds on him. He was a big 18 pound cat. And when he would run, his belly would flap from side to side. And my neighbor would say, I don't know if you know it, but your cat is pregnant. And I would say, you know, I'm really sure that she, that he's not. <laughs> so Roosevelt Greer, my teacher about the healing power of love and the natural world. May that find you soon and often. Thank you. Good night.
joy uh, for that story of love for your cat, uh, Rosie Greer. Um, and uh, I imagine that this story might resonate with many who've had a deep love for a pet and, and done such caring things for them and vice versa as well. So uh, thank you again, Joy. Now we're moving on to our next story for this evening with James Salvia. Hello, James. Good evening, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you for joining. Uh, I was just uh, collaborating with James yesterday, so good to see you again in a different setting. And I wanna tell folks about James who works at Boston EMS as a deputy superintendent with many years as an EMT and paramedic. James has also been working in the Boston area as an energy healer and animal communicator for over 20 years. James loves to travel and to cook. So James, um, I know that uh, you have done some traveling in very distant lands and um, I, ha I have not traveled as far away in my life. So I, I'm wondering for our audience, uh, what would you say that you love? What is it you love about traveling to far off places or wherever you have gone? I think the best part of traveling when you go far away is the moment that you get on an airplane that you're going to be there for, I don't know, 15 hours or so and end up in another time zone and another day and another, uh, you know, a day ahead or a day behind. Um, and you have, you have to let go. You have to be uh, out of control. Uh, you're, you're no longer in control. You're there. Um, and so you better enjoy what you're doing at that moment because there's no getting out of what you're doing. Um, I think it's liberating. Um, you end up in a new town or a new area. Um, the people are just, it's just so invigorating to, to meet new people that way. Uh, and especially when you have never been there before, you, you have no expectation. You have, you, you, it's hard to have expectation. It's hard to have any um, idea what, what you're going to encounter. So um, that's a part of travel, um, especially to some place that's different um, uh, and far off. Yeah, a sense of adventure and letting go. And, uh, oh, I remember once I did go to uh, France uh, because I was in a wedding. That's the one time I've been to Europe. And I remember going 15 times around one of the rotaries trying to figure out where to go there. <laughs> kind of resonates with what you're saying. But James, the other thing I wanted to ask you because you love to cook. And um, when we're collaborating, I'm always interested in what you're cooking for dinner. I, I didn't know it was such a passion that you love to cook. Uh, what is your favorite dish to cook? Uh, I, I, I don't know if I have a favorite dish. Wow. Um, I just love to eat. <laughs> uh, um, and, uh, you know, um, yeah, I, 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 I would, it, that's a hard one. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, I would have to put that back in my mind to think, but um, um, I really like to cook for people, I think is the best part, um, you know, um, and I think it's, it's, um, um, my uh, my passion is to is to put energy into the food for uh, who um, I'm kind of cooking for, and um, I'm lucky to have um, a really wonderful husband, a new husband, which uh, we 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 got married this year. So um, cooking for somebody that you love is really important, and uh, I think that's what cooking is about. So. Uh, well, congratulations and uh, keep cooking and let's take a look at your story. Thank you, James. Thanks. Good evening. Hey, my name is James. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a story of love. It's not a physical love. It's not an emotional love. No, it's kind of an emotional love. Um, it's about a meal, a meal that I had a long time ago in Paris. and. Um, it's one of those meals that um, uh, you can just remember everything. Um, I was there with a good friend of mine uh, and uh, a friend of his, 
And uh, we're in this small little restaurant um, uh, in this back alley because um, Aaron, who we were visiting, um, lived there, lived in Paris. So it was like being in Paris with somebody from Paris. So um, we got to go places and, and be places that um, you probably wouldn't know existed if you didn't live there. Anyhow, so we sat down and uh, it's a small little restaurant, um, not that many tables. Um, and um, the one thing that I remember um, and I can't forget um, to this day um, was I think I had coffee duck, um, which was delicious because I know the meal, the whole meal was delicious and a beautiful glass of red wine, but with the potatoes. The potatoes were these little balls of potato that were scooped out by hand and then, I don't know, baked or fried or something. And I'm sure they were cooked in some sort of wonderful fat. And I'm telling you, I was and still am in love with those little potatoes. Thank you, James. Uh, it's all about the potatoes there. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I would just ask to uh, audience who's watching and thinking about this story, um, you know, has there been a favorite meal in your life that you love to tell the story about? I was thinking that would probably make a good theme in itself. I, I know I have my own favorite stories and um, I'm, I have heard many too. So something to think about. And I did want to let folks know if you are interested in participating in an upcoming program um, you can send an email expressing your interest of being on the program to share a story or also to offer an up upcoming theme by sending an email to w u a s p uh, w u a s t p i'm sorry w u a s t p um, and uh, we can communicate about upcoming programs. So also feel free to talk in the chat and Mike can let, let me know what's going on if there are any comments out there. So thank you again, James. And next I would like to invite Monica Spencer for story number three this evening. Monica from Hopkinton down the street. Hello, <laughs> welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. Oh, well, uh, thank you for saying yes. And I love your background. And that is kind of uh, uh, indicating what you are about uh, in, in a way, this story. Um, and it's how I first came to know you, Monica. Uh, it was my pleasure in working on um, the Hopkinton Talent Show together. Just yes. a few years ago, maybe, I don't know, 15, 20? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was still that long ago, but yes, that's probably right. Yes. Um, and such a pleasure to work with you. Oh, and we had a great time. I, I enjoyed working with you also. For people, who, oh, thank you. Um, people who don't know, Monica has a beautiful singing voice, and I will tell you a little of her. Her information, as I introduce you, Monica Anderson Spencer is a soprano and a native of Washington, D.C. She's performed with such diverse organizations, performing opera with, performing with opera, with chorales, choruses, ballet, Alvin Ailey, and with jazz musicians as well. And Monica has also appeared as a soloist in the National Symphony Orchestra and others. And she has appeared in the United States and abroad in title roles in opera performances as well. And currently Monica is a principal actor, director and musical director with the Oscar Michaud Family Theater Program Company uh, in Boston. And Monica is a private voice teacher in Hopkinton and on the faculty of the Hopkinton Center for the Arts. And so Monica, um, 
I think that this story uh, I've heard in advance is a bit related to all that you are about music wise and um, opera indeed. I didn't know about opera until I got into college and uh, instantly fell in love with it and had to try to find somebody to go and listen to when the Met, uh, the New York Met would come out to Bridgewater State College. Um, uh, and uh, I wonder for you, how did your love of opera and opera singing get started? Um, it, that's very strange. I'm not sure. I believe it probably happened um, in maybe high school and um, just hearing certain singers and thinking, wow, just those voices would just elevate me and understanding that those, the songs that we're singing were actually from larger works, from, from operas. Um, back then, we didn't have YouTube or an easy way to press, but we had LPs. So finding you know, a recording and listening to it and becoming um, familiar with some of the great voices of the 20th century. Um, Pavarotti, you say a name like Pavarotti, a lot of people understand, um, recognize that name. But understanding the passion. And um, I know this may seem a very uh, sort of strange um, comparison, but knowing, you know, we always say music is the um, a universal language and different musics from different cultures are very different. And you don't necessarily perhaps uh, connect when you first hear the music um, of another culture. But for me, um, it was a type of soul music because, and again, coming from my cultural background and that idea of what soul music really means, it means singing something from the soul, something from deep within that not only connects, that you connect with, but can connect others to what it is that you are um, singing about feeling. And the idea of a performance is um, with any kind of acting, you have to inhabit the character and the character inhabits you. So to be able to make that connection. And then when I was in college, um, we weren't often able to afford tickets for Kennedy Center, but sometimes they would send um, student tickets over and then to be able to go down to the Opera House at the Kennedy Center and see some of these great works. Um, it was just something that just connected me, um, as I said, uh, and it, it, it started a passion in me for opera and other types of music, classical music and music from other cultures, understanding that um, you know, in so many different uh, cultures you will find uh, a type of theatrical music. Um, and just something else I wanted to say, uh, kind of harping back to something Joy had mentioned earlier about art and something that you're doing with these community stories, the idea of in so many cultures, art, and that's performance, I'm thinking of, of performing and visual arts, is something that's a part of every day. It's not something that's set off to the side. You make a beautiful basket because it brings you joy and it has a useful function. Um, and so it's not something that we set off to the side. And I think it's so important when we can incorporate these elements into our lives, not just to make us feel better, but also to connect with one another. So this idea of community um, storytelling reminds me of sitting around a fire and all the elders perhaps telling stories of, of the culture. So I just think this is a wonderful um, idea, a concept, and I thank you again for asking me to be a part of it. Well, thank you. I've heard this story twice now. I heard it a while <laughs> back and I love it every time I hear it. So let's take a look at the story you have to share. Thank you, Monica. Hello, my name is Monica Spencer. I'm a Hopkinton resident and I'm also a singer and a voice teacher. This is a story about a scarf and a dress. The scarf that I'm wearing was purchased almost a decade ago from a kiosk at Natick Mall. I was walking through the mall and I passed one of those kiosks that sell sunglasses and headbands and scarves. I love scarves and I have quite a collection of them. However, I wasn't looking to buy one this particular day. But as I passed this 
the kiosk, I saw this scarf and I knew I had to buy it. It reminded me of a dress I had seen in a department store many years ago. I was living in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area at the time, and there was a shopping mall in Rockville, Maryland, that had very high-end boutiques and department stores that I liked to browse through. Please note that I said browse, not purchase. As a performer, I liked to look in the evening wear section just to see what was in fashion and what I might be able to find at a much lower price somewhere else. One day, I was browsing the evening wear section in a department store called iMagnet. It was very, very high end, but again, I wasn't looking to purchase anything. And then I saw it, a mannequin dressed in the most beautiful gown I had ever seen. It was very pale pink, sleeveless with a V-neck, and it had layers upon layers of shimmery, soft pink chiffon from the waist to the floor. Although pink is not one of my favorite colors, I was immediately drawn to it. I had to touch it, and it was even softer to the touch than it looked. It was diaphanous. It was ethereal. It was $15,000. Now, mind you, this was at least 35 years ago. At that time, you could buy a really nice car for $15,000. I couldn't imagine paying that much for an article of clothing, but I also knew that it wouldn't be that price if the manufacturer didn't expect to sell it at that price, but it was love at first sight. So I made a commitment to visit the dress as often as I could. Sometimes I would just stand in front of it or and, and gaze at it. Sometimes I would imagine myself wearing it. Sometimes I would stand at a distance across the other side of the department store and glare at anyone who would dare go near it. But I knew it could never be mine. I knew it deserved a home with someone who could cherish it as much as I did. I visited that dress almost weekly for approximately three months until one day, it wasn't there. I looked around the department to see if it had been moved or placed on a rack, but it was gone. I was sad, but again, I had hoped someone who would cherish it as much as I did, would give it a loving home. And then decades later, I found this scar. Thank you, Monica, uh, for that story. And that sounds like unconditional love for that dress indeed. <laughs> and I do love your scarf. <laughs> so thank you again. You're welcome, Cheryl. And um, I, I, I want to uh, take a moment before we move on to our next story. Um, I'm seeing a bit of responses from the chat here. This one goes back to James's story and is related to potatoes. So I'm just gonna kind of weave it backwards a little bit. I hear from Polly Brown who said, my dad stayed alive during a forced march at the end of World War II by eating raw potatoes from the fields and became the founding director of the International Potato Center in Peru. Hooray for potatoes. So see what we're learning tonight from our stories. And, you know, uh, we might come up with a, maybe we'll come up with a story related to a dress in the window, Monica, later. So thank you again. And, uh, you see, we open up the concept of love and where it goes. We are covering all kinds of topics already. I would now like to introduce Dan Palacios. Coming from Hopkinton, there you are. Oh, no, you're not at Hopkinton, you're at the beach. <laughs> Good to see you, Dan. Hi, Cheryl. Thank you for being here and bringing your story tonight. I'll tell folks a little bit about you, Dan. 
Dan's a resident of Hopkinton for close to 22 years and the father of three, an avid runner who's uh, run four marathons and hoping to complete one more. Is that coming maybe in the next year or two, do you mean? If I can, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, once, once we get back to that, which we're looking forward to, but still recovering from a horrific cartwheel accident. Okay, I'll keep going. Chronic do-it-yourselfer who's been working on his house since he bought it 22 years ago and may finish it just before we sell, is what he says. Dan uh, lives, um, oh, <laughs> I, I added in here, Dan, that I live nearby and many a day I've seen you out on your ladder outside on the weekends. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And, and, da and Dan notes he's tired of the pandemic and working in his living room office. So, so Dan, uh, that gives us a little uh, idea of you, uh, of the essence of you. Um, so are you able to tell a little more about the cartwheel accident? When I was younger, I was able to do a cartwheel and I would Allie, my daughter, was was showing off her cartwheels um, in the backyard. So I decided to sh do the same thing. I was able to do two. And then on the third one, I didn't tear, but I pulled my um, hamstring, a major high hamstring pull that uh, took me six, six months to recover from. So <laughs> I could barely walk after that. Heard a loud snap. It was not good. <laughs> oh. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. So that uh, has an effect on running, I'm sure, too. But you're healing now or healed? I'm getting there. I'm able to run. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Mm -hmm. Maybe not so many cartwheels in your future. Never again. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and do it yourself or two. Uh, um, where, where did you learn how to do that, Dan? So my, my father... Um, was very much into, you know, he helped me repairing my car. Um, and, you know, anytime we had to do anything in the house, he wasn't afraid to just, you know, start doing it. He completely redid his basement, um, installed all the, the sheetrock and the wiring and the plumbing and all that stuff. So he was a good, you know, role model. He really, anytime I need help, you know, I give him a call. Well, that is good to hear, to count on someone like that and be inspired by them. And I think that weaves into your story a bit as you make reference of him helping you with your car. So uh, why don't we take a look now and see Dan's story next. Hi, this story is about love, although it might not seem like it at first. My sister and I grew up on a cul-de-sac uh, there was very little traffic, and we used to play in the street all the time. We played street hockey, we rode skateboards, but what, one of the things we really liked to do was play Frisbee. Now, I was a really good Frisbee player. I could throw it forward, forwards, backwards. I could skim it really low to the, to the ground. Um, but my sister, she was terrible. She was terrible at Frisbee. She couldn't throw it straight. She couldn't, she wasn't accurate. Um, we would throw like about four or five times and invariably she would throw it across the, the street and into the neighbor's yard and hit their prize dogwood. Now, every time this happened, our neighbor would come running out of the house down to the street and start yelling at us. And this happened about four or five times. And after the fifth time, Mrs. Ivanison came running down. She screaming, grabbed the Frisbee, said we'd never see it again and brought it into the house. My sister and I didn't know what to do. We went back to my parents and we talked to them and they said, well, what you need to do is go over and apologize and ask for the Frisbee back. So my sister and I walked over, rang the doorbell. Mrs. Ivaniston came out. We asked for the Frisbee. We said we were really sorry. We'd never do this again. And Mrs. Ivaniston said, no, absolutely not. I'm not giving you back the Frisbee. We were stunned. How could she do this? How could she be so mean? I paid for that Frisbee. That was my favorite Frisbee. Um, I, every time we saw Mrs. Ivanison after that, we would just think of that incident and 
I really, I started to, to, to hate Mrs. Afghanistan. Well, five or six years later, I bought my first car. I graduated from high school. The car was a 1970 Nova SS. It had a 350 horsepower engine, a four barrel carburetor. I put really big, big tires in the back and I jacked up the back end. I wanted to look like a race car. My mom used to drive the car and she got pulled over by a cop once, but that's a different story. I was driving home one day and I noticed that the car started to shake quite a bit. Um, and I knew that it wasn't the tires because I just got those tire, the tires balanced. So I brought it home, I parked it in the driveway and I decided to go in and get my tools. And I was going to crawl into the car to see what the problem was. I kind of suspected that it was the drive shaft and maybe the U-joint had start, was starting to go. So I, I got under the car and I started to, I, I removed all the bolts and I started to pull the drive shaft out of the transmission. Um, but I'd made a, a, a big mistake. I, I'd forgotten that the transmission is what's holding the car in place when you put it in the park. And as soon as you take the drive shaft off, the car will start to roll. So I pulled and I pulled and I finally got the drive shaft out and the car rolled. I didn't know what to do. I didn't have anything I could put underneath the tires to stop it from rolling. So I pinned my shoulder up against the frame and I held it in place that way. And I started calling out to my mom. I was like, mommy, she's going hear me. And then I started to get louder, louder and louder. I started yelling, mommy, nothing. And I started to scream. And then I started to swear. And I started swearing and screaming. I sounded, you know, I was using really bad language, something that I don't use to this day. I was yelling so loud, nobody heard me. The whole neighborhood, nobody was around. Nobody could hear me yelling underneath the car. My shoulder was hurting. I thought I was gonna get run over. I was, thought I was gonna be dead. I had tire tracks across my chest. My parents would find me dead underneath the car. So I was still screaming when all of a sudden, his head popped underneath the car and looked at me and said, is there anything wrong? And I said, oh no, Mrs. Ivanison, there's nothing wrong. Could you open the door, get into the car and pull up on the emergency brake, please? And she said, of course. And so she got in the car and pulled up on the emergency brake. And then she got out and I crawled out from under the car and I said, thank you so much. And she went, proceeded to go back home. Well, to this day, I love Mrs. Ivanison. She saved my life. If it wasn't for her, I'd have been dead. And the funny part is, the reason why my mom couldn't hear me was because she'd been vacuuming all day. So that's my story. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, Dan, I'm glad you're here. Thank goodness <laughs> for your neighbor. Um, uh, and thank you for that story also. Um, wow, that's quite something. And thank goodness that we have uh, good neighbors, even if they might be crotchety previously. Can you say her name again, please? Uh, Mrs. Ivanison. Yes, well, here's to Mrs. Ivanison tonight as we think about love. That's right. <laughs> Raise our cup. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dan. Oh, you're welcome. All right. Have a good weekend uh, up on your ladder. I'll be looking for you there. <laughs> okay. Next for our community stories, we have Dot Walsh in the house tonight. Hello, Dot. Oh, are you on mute? Uh, yes, I see you there. Okay, try one more unmuting. I'll tell you a little bit about Dot while she is uh, taking care of her mute button there. And that um, Dot told me when I was asking for a little bio information, she likes adventures with companions. And she uh, is her best when she's with people she loves and she loves many people. And I said, well, could we tell a little bit more baby about what I know of you since I met you? I met Dot as the chaplain at the Sherborne Peace Abbey 
when it was open, Dot has been a peace activist um, through the years. She has had her own cable TV program over in Dedham called Oneness and Wellness. She has conducted ceremonies such as weddings and other services. She has given peace related awards to over 100 peace builders and leaders in the world, including Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and many others um, who have been connected with the Peace Abbey. She has also worked with incarcerated men. I believe that's where you met Mother Teresa, right? And that work inspired her so much that uh, she wrote a book um, called Finding Light in the Darkness, Stories from Prison that Bear Witness to Hope, Faith, and Love Despite Man's Inhumanity to Man. And uh, so that is a little more about Dot, but it's also for you to know it's Dot's birthday today and she is joining us on her birthday. So happy birthday, dear Dot, and thank you for joining us. I still can't hear your voice. No. Nope. And I still can't. Gosh, I'm sorry. Maybe we can try after, but why don't we take a look at your story next? And maybe afterwards we'll be able to talk. But happy. Hello, everyone. My story tonight is entitled Ageless Eros. And I want to start with a quotation. Prayer in action is love. Love in action is service. And this is the story of my friend Louisa. Louisa was born in Venezuela. She went to school there, college, and medical school. She had two children, and she was, loved her work, but she wanted to come to the United States to do an internship at Harvard Medical, which she did. And after the year, she said, this is where I want to live. So she came back the following year with her children, found a place to live, and then internship at Children's Hospital. And after that internship, she decided that she wanted to stay here, and she got a job at Dedham Medical as a pediatrician. And that's where I met Louisa. I brought my children there, and I loved how she treated each child differently. She brought out the best in them. She was interested in each one. And then my son, Tim, who was the youngest, um, when he was born, he had to be transfused immediately. So she came to the hospital with me while I had the C-section, and then she stayed, and she watched while they transfused him, and then she stayed all night with him to make sure he was all right. So that's the kind of person she was, kind of the kind of doctor that she was. So we began to work, we liked each other, and we began to work together on projects because we shared the same interests. She want, was a peacemaker, wanted to work on peace projects. She also wanted to work on violence prevention and study nonviolence. And so she was doing some work at Harvard, and she wanted violence to be part of the health program there. So we did work together and, um, and our children played together and we really, we connected very deeply. In her 70s, we stayed friends, but in her 70s, she was diagnosed with cancer. And while she was having um, chemo and she was having her, you know, taking care of her health, she retired from her job. And, but she didn't retire from life. She was that kind of person. So she, what did she do? She loved Museum of Fine Arts. So she became a docent at the Museum of Fine Arts. And she worked with blind individuals who were blind and had trouble or had visual hearing, prop, uh, seeing problems. And she had this one person and she wrote a book about him, My Time with Daniel. And she, he was blind. She took him, put gloves on him, and she was allowed to touch some of the, set, the statues. She told him about Egypt. She brought, you know, uh, food from Egypt so they could taste. When she was doing painting, she brought paint that he could touch and feel the different, 
you know, the roughness of it. And she would explain the, the art project that they were looking at. And so that was what she did for a number of years. Then she went back to Argentina to check on her, you know, the home that was there. And she met this man and they began this wonderful relationship. And here she was close to 80, in her 80s. And the two of them enjoyed walking, talking, sharing, going to, uh, you know, the art museums. And um, she stayed with him until he passed away. And she came back, instead of going back to Boston, she went to New York where her daughter Odile was living. And she lived there and she became a docent at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And she worked with people all the time. Everyone knew Louisa. Then the COVID came and she wasn't able to leave her apartment. And so she would walk around with her, you know, the, the uh, walker. And I got an, an email from her and it said, well, my doctor has given up on me. He's put me in hospice here in my home, but I haven't given up on myself and I'm a doctor, so I'm going on. And so she did and she would type letters and she would call people and she stayed active and she still is active. So I say, what a beautiful life. She wrote a memoir, the story of Daniel, um, Ageless Eros, and um, stayed very active in her life. And so I'd like to end with the quotation that I started with. Prayer in action is love, and love in action is service. I love you, Louisa. Thank you, Dot, and that beautiful story of Louisa, whom you love. Uh, we, uh, I see uh, hands going with gratitude in the gallery. Uh, are we able to hear you now out there where you are in Rhode Island? Mm, I still can't hear you. Oh, frustrating. And it's your birthday, too. <laughs> no. Oh, well. Well, it looks like you're saying beautiful words, and I want to say happy birthday, and thank you for sharing the gift of Louisa with your story tonight. Thank you very much, Dot. So I imagine that um, as we hear Dot's beautiful story and tribute to Louisa, we all might think of somebody in our life who has affected us similarly, uh, that there, there are many stories of tribute we can share. Next, we are moving on to John V. Puri. And I will tell you a little bit about John V. There you are. Hi, John V. Hi, Ms. Pearl. How are you? I'm doing very well and delighted you can join us this evening. Um, and you are um, in Hopkinton. Yes, um, I, so just to give a little bit of background, I actually moved to Hopkinton in seventh grade from Framingham. So I lived in Framingham for most of my life, went, um, then went to Hopkinton Middle School and the high school, and now I'm a senior at uh, UMass Amherst uh, studying biology. That's right, and congratulations, and doing very well. You're in your last year. You're going to graduate in May, which is very exciting, and you're in the uh, the route in biology on the um, medical track that you're hoping to go forward and work in medicine, as I understand, and I've known you since sixth grade and have always enjoyed uh, watching you uh, move forward in the areas of your interest and love. And I know, John V, you also noted for your bio that you have continued with your love for poetry and stories. You've been working in um, hospice and nursing home settings and sharing poetry, which has, as you noted, has enabled you to form a nice com camaraderie with people there and because of your past and current work in geriatrics that you're thinking to work in that field after medical school as well. And uh, you have worked in hospice and you're working as well currently 
in your final semester. So you, you've been in a lot of set medical settings already. Uh, what, do you, what do you say about the uh, intersection of medicine with art, like uh, sharing stories or poetry? Yes, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think for me, art, um, as you mentioned, it, it definitely has a regenerative property, as I like to call it. It's, um, it's transformative, it's healing, and it has a different meaning for everyone. Um, where, whereas some people, at least in the places I've worked, like, have loved poetry and have, um, and I've, and I've found a camaraderie with them as well as with other people. Others, others haven't really liked it as much. It hasn't been as transformative and healing for them. So there's, there's different ways of definitely di dealing with different people and finding what works for them. Uh, whether, whether it's medicine or whether it's, uh, helping them sort of find their inner peace. And that to me is an art in itself. Um, so it's the intersection between giving someone, the, giving someone the art of medicine, as I like to call it, um, in the field of medicine is, it's, it's, a really, it's a really interesting thing that, I, that I'd like to sort of focus on more. It's kind of the social psychology aspect, as I like to call it, because we, I mean, we like to we, we like to say that you know there's there's always a cure somewhere out there um, at least the way just the way the science works. But I think I think I think art teaches us it, medicine runs much deeper than that, and the mind really the mind is the most important part in um, in healing someone. I think. Well, thank you. I hadn't. I hadn't asked you uh, or told you that I'd be asking you that question. And it is a really big question. And I think you're ahead of your time. And so uh, thank you for giving that thoughtful response. And now we're going to take a look at your story. Are you ready? Thank you. I'm ready. <laughs> All right, we'll take a look. Thank you for recording this for us. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is John Ritiri, um, and I'm actually here just to, it's, I'm here to tell a simple but kind of unusual story. Uh, so this, this story is uh, primarily relevant to my childhood days. Um, so basically, uh, I, I never really knew the concept of love until, uh, until I really, I guess, dug deep into it and, uh, and actually started thinking about it when I was younger. And the, uh, my primary uh, or source of love was really for my parents because being an only child, I was always the center of attention. And, and uh, yeah, the, their, their primary source of love was me. So it was always, we were, we were always very close as a family and still are. Um, so this, this story actually specifically focuses between me and my dad. My dad would always, work every single day except for Sunday. He actually had a part-time job in during the weekends as a security officer. Uh, and Sundays would be the only day he didn't work that weekend. So what we would do on Sundays, which would be very unusual, we would always go grocery shopping together. So instead of, I, I know most people usually collect all their groceries for the month, like they go one week and they get all their groceries, but we went every week, that was our ritual. And we would always we would always go to BJ's every single weekend, and I would I would always oddly for an eight eight or nine year old I would always be excited to go with him because that would that would be my one day of the week with him since he was always so busy. And we we would uh, get our stuff together and go in the car, and even the car ride to BJ's was always fun. We would sing songs and just talk and even have deep, deep conversations. And that's when I actually realized like, wow, I really love my dad. And he's actually one of my best friends. Sounds cheesy, but it was true at the time. And so, yeah, we would, we would always, uh, we would always sing along to different tunes in the car. And then once we actually reached the DJs, that's when, you know, that's when our game face was on. We would, we would be on the hunt for different groceries and, um, and we would come prepared and during our shopping visits and 
since we were very particular on coupons and found different ways to save. So I, I started learning how to save money from a very young age because I was so close to my dad. And I would be in charge of cutting the coupon. So money saving was actually dependent on me. And I, I, every weekend we would just scour the aisles and I, I, would have, I would have a lot of fun picking out different items that I wanted, um, especially food items. And my dad and I would go around um, each aisle and uh, look for uh, those, those free samples that you would get. Um, and when they're when Beaches was advertising um, new products or new foods that they were selling or even existing ones that they just wanted uh, to sample. Um, so that would that would always be a fun experience. We still do it sometimes. We don't do it as much since I'm in college, but just uh, just those particular moments in time are something I really treasure. And it turns out um, a very similar story was actually published um, as a college essay when I was applying to college back in uh, 2017. And it was written by Brittany Stinson. And apparently it went on to be like one of, um, one of the most glowing college essays out there during that year. And she ended up getting into all these prestigious, prestigious Ivy League schools. Um, and it's, it was funny because she was telling my story and it, and, it, and I saw so much of myself in her and, and the way she just described uh, scouring the aisles, looking for free samples, being with her parents just that one day of the week and having all that time uh, to herself, it really described me. Um, so I, that, was, uh, that was one of the reasons I felt inspired to kind of tell this story and, um, and just relate myself as a human being to um, to her and as well as hopefully to other people in this community. Um, and going on the, uh, going along the lines of the topic of love, um, UMass, uh, where I go to UMass Amherst, they're really big on the topic of love as well, or self-love, um, especially during this challenging time. And I just wanted to read a quick quote um, that I think is relevant. Um, so this quote is by Elaine Gay Botton. And, um, he says that love is at its most necessary when we are weak, when we feel incomplete, and we must show love to one another at those points. Um, so yeah, I, I, thought, I thought this was especially fitting for a challenging um, historical time like this. Um, and another quote actually from one of the master's uh, weekly newsletters, this is something they send out um, to us weekly for, uh, for our well-being. Um, it says, uh, what does love look like? Shoveling out your friend's car at 6 a.m. when those hard icy snow pellets are falling from the sky. Um, listening until the wee hours when your sister has gotten her heart broken. Wearing your mask and maybe staying six feet away from someone can be a demonstration of love. And it's easy to love when it is butterflies and sunshine, but consequential love takes grit, which is one of my favorite words. Um, and we're all stressed and it's not easy to extend goodwill to one another, but acts of kindness and altruism have actually been shown to boost the giver's well-being. And uh, I just wanted to say your community needs you to show some love so now, now more than ever. So much, John V, for your wonderful story and your wisdom and your quotes and and look your story of simple pleasure of love of grocery shopping of love of your father uh, and where it goes in the world it, in uh, out there in journalism and uh, and moving people on for your highlighting what is important in love can be right up close to us uh, every week on Saturdays at the grocery store even. Thank you very much for sharing your story, John V. And now we are moving on with our stories and I would like to introduce John Coutinho. Hello, John. Um, and uh, there we go. Am I? Okay, great. I'm on mute. Hello in Hopkinton. And I want to say about John that um, I had sent an email of invitation to share a story and John had been away. And the day before the stories were due, he, he opened his email getting back and said he would work on a story right away. And I appreciate that, your kindness. I appreciate that, John. 
And I'll tell you a little bit about John, who has lived in Hopkinton for 23 years and expresses a love of his family with two daughters raised in the Hopkinton school systems who have received scholarships for college. And most recently, uh, one of his daughters has been accepted to Oxford for a graduate degree and also expresses a love for his mother, Fran, who moved to Hopkinton at age 85 and thoroughly enjoyed her life here for 12 years. And also his wife, Brenda, or Dr. Brenda, as most know her in town, as an OBGYN doctor. And John also talks of love and community, almost 30 years of association with the schools as a volunteer, a dozen years of service in zoning advisory and planning board for four years, and a liaison for the Boston Athletic Association for the past six years. John writes, I love our town of Hopkinton. And uh, John offers a story of love and John, I'll just say I met you uh, the first time over a year ago at a Martin Luther King Jr. event. And I, I remembered you spoke of your great love for your family and your work and your town. And I think the last time I saw you was on Hopkinton Hangout Hour at the same time I was on that program. And I just wondered how things have been going for you since. Uh, anything you would like to add uh, for your where you've been and your and your uh, yeah i'm just i'm just really so glad to be here you know i i i'm so glad to catch this this uh program um you know it's um you know for millennia you know the the only way information was transferred was mouth to ear you know it was, it's all about stories you know and and you know we're in this whole new era of of electronic communication you know in this past year that you know we're not together we're, we, we're virtually together so i just hope that, that that at some point it can get back to multi-ear um you know and you know that it wasn't you know written word came a lot a lot later than 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 just this storytelling time you know uh uh, I, I'm, I'm torn because I'm glad to be here, but I'm so intimidated. These stories are great. These are some great stories. Now I feel terrible that that I you you, you asked me to put a story together of what you know what all you need is love meant to me, and and I just sat right here, pushed this pushed on, and came did the first thing that came to my head. And I wish I had put had more time uh, but i was away for a month and as everybody knows when you're away for a month and you come back it's almost not worth going on vacation the the amount i i, I own a i do um uh real estate development and so i had houses that were all falling behind nobody did any work while i was away but anyway it was just great you know the, you know what, what i loved about this this whole thing is that we're all connected by art you know, from 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 Joy's first story, you know, speaking about art, and you and you started with the poetry, and 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 cooking, and singing, and acting, and and, and medicine. It's all art, mm -hmm. and that's what connects us. And this is so. It, it's just the and, and the love of art. This is just great. You know, when Joy started talking about Rosie Greer, I I, I you know my grandmother wanted me, my grandmother and mother wanted to raise me. I was grew up with three older sisters, a mother and a grandmother, and they wanted to raise me not to be dependent on a woman. So my grandmother taught me how to knit and crochet and, and needlepoint. And, and but it was only because of Rosie Greer that I wasn't intimidated by my friends. And I'm so glad now that my daughters think it's the coolest thing that their dad can do all that stuff. But, you know, it's just, I, I just loved it. And, and you know, when, when I heard uh, Dan's story, yeah, I got crushed under a pal once too at the same age. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same thing. That's why I just went like this. I saw your empathy, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's um, what stories do. It's just great. It's just, you know, thank you for, for inviting me. I, and I'm not going to miss another one of these now. Oh, well, and remember, um, you probably didn't hear at the beginning, but it's very important. No judgment of self or one another. These Every oh, story is important. It's and, awesome. So we look forward to seeing yours now. So let's take a look at John's story. When I think of today's subject, all you need is love. You know, I think of all the songs. I think of the movie Love Actually. Love is all around us. But uh, I really think of the 
first time I looked at my daughter in the incubator and she looks up at me and she can look right into my soul. I think of the first time that I held my wife's hand and it just fit, it was magic. When I think of my parents walking down the Cape, married over 60 years, holding hands and looking at each other. And it was just amazing. And I think of my mother several years ago when she used to drive that big Cadillac Eldorado and um, how she would always drive down School Street to West Main Street and make the left to head to CVS or to the hairdresser or to the um, senior center. And I'd say, Mom, please go down West Elm, that intersection. This is before they had the light. It's too dangerous. She said, No, nope, I'm telling you, before I get to that intersection, I look up and I say, Manny, clear the way. And your father from heaven always clears the way for me. And it just got me nervous. So, but then one day she said, John, we're, I want you to take you to my dentist. And I said, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So next thing you know, next morning, she pulls up in front of the house, honks a big Cadillac horn, and says, get in the car. I said, no, no, I'm, I'll, I'll drive, I'll drive. Said, nope, I'm driving. So I get in the car, and there she is, and they're little, little, little looking up at the steering wheel. And um, we make the turn onto School Street, and then she goes past West Elm, and I watch her lips go. And next thing you know, we get to that intersection. Now, here's West Main Street, as all of you know, that they're either going 50 miles an hour on one side and stopped on the other, and that's always busy. There wasn't a single car. Not a single car to see. Tumbleweeds could have been going down the street. And she makes the turn, turns to me and said, I told you, your father's always looking out for me. So love, love has no bounds. Love, it goes on forever. So I just think it's important for all of us to just uh, go forth and love one another. Let's do what, uh, what God wants us to do. And um, we can really make the world a better place. So thanks for listening to me. Have a great day. Shalom. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, John, for that story of love with wisdom as well. And so please keep telling more stories too. Thank you. I'm just glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. God bless. Really, it, it, this is this is awesome. Oh, what good, a good. great thing you put together. I'm I'm delighted that you had fun. Thank you so much. So, um, what do you all have uh, related to stories of mothers in cars, perhaps, or love of mother? Uh, to consider that as a story to tell in your life. And we're moving on now. Uh, we have just uh, three more stories. And I do see I had predicted it would be 8.15 because we ended at 8.15 last time. Um, so I, uh, it looks like we're running a little later than that. Um, but I'm getting, I'm getting the hang of this. Uh, typically hosting, it would be mm, two hours. I think a bittersweet cafe. So uh, we are in the spirit of that. If you're able to continue on with us, I'm really excited to keep going with three more uh, special stories as well. And next we have Nudrat Cosme. And oh, there you are. And you're not in a car anymore, Nudrat. Hi, everyone. I just waited here. So perfect timing. Oh, excellent. Well, uh, thank you for joining and sharing your story as well. And uh, just for people who do not know Nudrat, she is a, an activist, a peace uh, activist, a philanthropist, a school administrator for Mazumin Sunday School in Hopkinton, director of IMF, a nonprofit organization, and Nudrat works in the healthcare information technology as well. And so thank you so much for sharing your story uh, Nudrat, and uh, I know I was talking with you one day on the phone about a different program um, 
uh, in town uh, that was happening. And I heard you were, I think you were in Boston somewhere uh, at a peace um, assembly. But, yes, I was. And uh, I get the sense that you care very much for our, uh, our world and uh, for, I wonder, um, for our children also, you're involved as a school administrator and you have your own uh, child. And I wonder if you could tell, just say for a moment, uh, what is your wish for our children our future, in our future generations? Hi, everyone. Well, um, I hear some children, too. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's my friend's kids, so oh, yeah. Okay. So I, I'm at a resort, uh, Loon Mountain, my daughter skis, so, so I want her to ski here, so we just got here. Ah, wonderful. Well, yes. I, hope you, I hope you have a wonderful time. Thank you. Um, yeah, so who doesn't love children, right? I mean, I love kids, and uh, I think raising kids is a very, very um, tedious and critical job for parents, as well as the uh, caretakers because they are our future, right? So, and it's their base. They are like a sponge. Whatever we instill in them, they're gonna absorb that. And that's what they're gonna become. So I think it's a very big responsibility. I mean, I will say on me, I'm a single parent. So, and she is 80, 90% of the time with me. So, and last year has been very crazy and tough because, you know, I, I had her pretty much 100% uh, of the time. And with the remote working as well as her remote 100% school. So it, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I have had some, you know, I learned patience and I'm still learning patience because obviously, you know, I mean, as much as I love her, I want her to be disciplined. I want her to be organized and all that. Yeah. So, so that's all like my advice uh, for all the parents and the kids is to listen to the parents, try to, um, you know, not talk back. They know the best. Uh, for the kids and everything is of course um, uh, for their best interest and parents to also keep their cool and just play with them spend time there's pros and cons um, of this pandemic right so everybody is together under one roof so learning more about their family weaknesses strength so take advantage of that as much as um, everyone can yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for answering that question. You didn't expect, and I know you're, you have, you share a wonderful story and it involves a child. Um, so I would love to have everyone take a look at your story now. And thank you so much, Nudrat. Thank you. Good evening. All you need is love. My name is Nudrat and I will share my experience based on love. So basically it's um, about love for humanity i was back home visiting my family and it's it's a culture there you know at night time you go out with your cousins your friends and your family after dinner to grab some ice cream or smoothies or juice coffee tea you park your car outside these little uh, restaurants and the waiter comes and asks your order and then you tell him what you want to eat or drink so I um, ordered an ice cream. While I was um, waiting, I watched, uh, like I was looking at this very little, maybe seven or eight year old boy holding a newspaper in his hand and just, you know, just wandering around. As soon as my ice cream came, this boy came running to me and he was trying to sell newspaper to me and I, took the newspaper and it had all the oil marks on it it was not even that day's newspaper it was like very old newspaper and he was trying to sell that for me to me for uh, for money and i was like wow you know the first thing was that okay he is that selfless like okay he has that um you know he's not begging for money he's not a beggar but he's asking for that so i offered him ice cream and as soon as I offered him ice cream, um, he took the ice cream and he walked away. And I called him and I said, where are you going? He turned back, he's like, oh, I have a little sister who loves ice cream. My, I had tears in my eyes. I, I was like, wow, a seven to eight year old boy 
and he has this selfless love for her sister and i mean who resists these at this age right all we need is like chocolate ice cream and all these fun things to eat but this boy instead of just you know grabbing it and eating he's like okay i'm going to share it with my sister um i still have that newspaper to date so by this you know i'm like we tend to be unthankful sometimes we tend to be selfish but humanity i mean by humanity you know i'm talking about that basic principle you know on which we build our society and civilizations um it is required for anyone survival like i personally i cannot live in an isolated environment you know i need people i need a society i belong from this society you know like i need society to i cannot fight uh, with diseases on my own right i have to see a doctor i have to you know i i just cannot be happy without my participation in the society so you know and this boy that i'm talking about he wasn't you know uh, speaking my language but we were able to understand you know what he was talking about and he tr- he made sure he um you know uh made his point across me um so it doesn't matter what language you speak what culture you belong from what religion you are you know you have to have love for humanity you have to have uh morals you have to have respect for anyone out there um and um and that's it so i i was so touched by this little boy and it also it tells me to have self respect it also uh, it teaches me uh, to have patience you know and not to be greedy like all i i can do is just grab that ice cream and just like you know just chuck it down my throat but no um so that was my little tiny piece of experience that i shared with you guys and i look forward to listening other uh, people's experiences thank you so much take care bye bye thank you so much nudrat for that you're welcome story. my pleasure and for learning from that child uh, absolutely ice cream cone a newspaper and about love of humanity as well all in that story thank you thank so much. you you're welcome we have uh, next with us becky shebley shebley hall uh becky is here hi thank you for being here um uh, there's so many stories of uh the the stories that have come in uh for this program and thank you becky i know you've been working hard and got your story in today and i'm so glad you did <laughs> and um also to be with us before you go off um for the weekend uh for a well deserved time to um go away and i'll tell folks about becky that uh she has spent her years working for people experiencing homelessness currently as a unitarian universalist minister and becky serves at chaplains on the way offering spiritual companionship and practice to the unhoused community in waltham and a community minister at first parish waltham uh, and becky relishes her other roles as a mother a sister a spouse and a friend and she likes to grow things and is witness to the f- transformative power of love um so becky thank you so much for coming and sharing your story and i don't know uh but it's been such such a week and you got this story and what would you like to say before we see your story you know what i want i would really love it cheryl if you could talk a little bit about the storytelling that we've been doing you and i and and um stephanie and teresa that was a pretty amazing moment yeah it was an amazing moment um uh so yes well that that takes some time but i'll just say it's been my pleasure to uh be of assistance in inviting some women who are staying at a shelter in Waltham is that correct um, uh one's on the shelter one's on the street on the street okay so uh these are women who are experiencing homelessness there and uh Becky works with as a chaplain with chaplain on the way and is uh 
with women and, and men out in the streets of Waltham and uh, in the shelters connected to the shelters and, and the common buildings where sometimes coffee is served and people can get together. And Becky has had an interest in getting uh, women together to share their stories of life and to listen to one another and, and um, has invited me in to come in and invite uh, the women to share stories from their life. And I, I know there was that one time uh, where we it worked in a small <laughs> circle. It was just amazing. The stories so was so beautiful. Up. It was really transformative for all of us there. Yeah. So uh, there is really something to uh, the healing and growing power of sharing our stories. And I look forward to being in more circles uh, with you. But uh, we have uh, uh, your story coming up, and I'm just um, so happy that you could share it with us before you go. Thank so you. why don't we take a look? Thank you, Becky. Rayanne, my dear Rayanne. I used to meet her at McDonald's with a community of people experiencing homelessness in Waltham, where the chaplains and I would show up to offer coffee and conversation. Some days she'd come there with the enthusiasm of a new puppy tail wagging and throw her arms around me and walk in to get a coffee. 16 sugars, seven milks, three squirts of hazelnut. Yeah, Becky, I like a little coffee in my morning milkshake, she'd say. Other mornings, she'd just be sitting there in a pile with her back against the wall on the sidewalk. Depended on what happened to her the night before or where she was in her cycle of addiction. And on those mornings, I'd just sit down next to her, put my arm around her and say, Rayanne, you are a beautiful person and I love you so much. So it was the afternoon of one of those mornings and she had called me up to the playground where she used to hang out because she said, I can't do this anymore. And the, the raw scrapes on her arm from the place where she sawed her key there, you know, let me to believe I understood what she was saying. And then now the ambulance is coming up Moody Street. I can hear its sirens. She had agreed just like five minutes ago to this. And now she is having second and third thoughts because she knows something I don't know, which is in the emergency room at Newton Wellesley Hospital, they don't treat you for your, your cravings when you're crashing on heroin. So she's telling me, Becky, I've got to score. I've got to get high before I get in that ambulance. But then the ambulance is there and she's trying to fight, but she's not walking away. And I say, Rayanne, I'll be with you, thinking I could. And she said, okay, if you come in this ambulance with me, I will come, I will go. And I said, I will. And they let her in and then they push me out. And I yell back, I'm following you. I'll meet you there. And so driving as fast as I can, flashing my reverend business card, I get myself into the room where she is in the emergency room. And she's just lying there, kind of starting to shake, curling up in a ball. And then she starts saying, Haldol, I need Haldol. They won't give me Haldol. And I'm rubbing her back and 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 patting her head and telling her I love her. And, and then they come in and they ask me to leave and I don't want to. And she says, Becky, it's okay to go out. Just go get me some grape drink. There's, you know, like sugary grape drink. So I leave the room and then I hear things being turned over and just so much chaos. And I try to go back in and, and, uh, and I, they won't let me in. And I hear her saying, that's my minister. She loves me. Let her in. And I'm yelling, that's Rayanne. I love her. Let me in. So it's not a great ending to that story. I came back the next morning. She was still in the emergency room. I brought her crowns to draw. I rubbed her back. 
And I wish I could say that she went on from one detox to another, to a program, because I know lots of people who have. I've, I've accompanied many people who have. But what happened to Rayanne is she went into Boston because Waltham was too small for her. And very frequently, I would get phone calls from colleagues or other people who said, so Rayanne was at my program. She lost her phone again. She wants you to know she loves you. So Rayanne died four years ago. And she's still with me. Yeah, I look at a shooting star and I know that sounds like a cliche. But I hear Rayanne saying, that's my minister. I love her. And me yelling back, I love you, Rayanne. And I carry that with me forever. And that's my story of love. Thank you, Becky. Yeah. That's uh, quite a story. Mm -hmm. And thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. uh, Listening to so many people uh, of the communities that you work with and for saying, I love you. Um, and having it be felt and having it transmit beyond and the people you work with as well. It's a real honor to work in a job where you get to say that approximately 67 times a week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, just roughly. Yeah. Well, please keep saying it and uh, please uh, keep uh, telling stories and uh, invite stories of the women and the men that you work with as well. Thank you. uh, So that we feel all closer together. And please take care of yourself this weekend too. Yeah, I will. All right, thank you, Becky. All right, folks. uh, The last story of this evening is our own Jim Cousins. Are you still here, Jim? Yes, I am still here. (laughs) Well, Jim. Uh, thank you so much for making this happen. And we get to end with you because this week I was asking for uh, a few more stories, right? Yeah, that's right. Here I am. (laughs) And you surprised me by saying you came up with one. And um, I want to just thank you for making this program happen. And uh, I'll just tell folks who don't know you that Jim was born and raised in Massachusetts. His bio says he's married with three children. He's a station manager at HCAM TV. He is a lover of science fiction and fantasy and the owner of the cutest dog in the country. In the county, in the county. Oh, (laughs) oh, I thought that was a typo. Okay, so you have some level of, uh, you know, of, um, oh, I don't want I don't want to be too grandiose about it, you know. Right, right. That's what I'm. And and your dog, what what is the name of your um, such uh, cute dog? Uh, his name is Percival, but we call him Percy. Percy. Oh well, that's a sweet dog, a sweet name for a cutest dog of the county. So, uh, Jim, could we see your story of love, please? Hello, my name is Jim. And I'd like to thank Cheryl for inviting me onto this program. I am very interested in love. The older I get, the more I think about it. There are so many different kinds of love. The love that you would have for your spouse or your partner, the love that a parent would have for their child, the love you would have for food or location, um, the love that a child has for their parent. They're all different and they all are so unique and I just find very interesting. My little story today is about a parent's love for their child. Now, several years ago, I was attending a church where we would take a survey to try to discern where our gifts lie. And then we could use that information to try to figure out how best we could serve and volunteer in the community. So this survey was a list of different skills and abilities, and you would have choices. You would rate how good you were at each thing on a scale of one to five, with one being no experience, no skill in that, and five being um, pretty good at it. So the first thing you would do is just take the test yourself and just get kind of a baseline of where you thought your skills uh, skills lined up. And then you would pass out copies of the 
questionnaire to some friends and some family, and you would have them fill it out, and you would compare and see how people saw you and how that lined up with uh, what you thought of yourself and where you might be best serving. So I filled it out, and I had some friends and family fill it out. And as you might imagine, it was mostly pretty affirming. Uh, a lot of my friends and family thought that I was pretty good with technology and that I liked woodworking and things like that. However, one of the questionnaires really stood out from the other ones. And that was the one that my mother filled out. When I looked at that, every skill was a four or a five, straight down the line, no matter what it was, even sewing. And I had never sewn a thing. I still haven't sewn a thing in my entire life. So of course, I went back to my mom and I said, I got four and fives in everything, mom. What, what, do you, what is that? Even sewing. And she said, well, Jimmy, I think that if you wanted to sew something, you would probably be pretty good at it. And that story has become a legend in my family. And we often say, oh yeah, you know, you know, even if Jimmy wanted to sew, he'd probably be pretty good at it. And what that shorthand really is saying is that a mother's love for their child is unique in the way that it doesn't just see the person. It also sees the best and the potential and believing in their child. Uh, and that has always been very meaningful to me. Well, thank you, Jim, and for that powerful story of a mother's love. And you made me think of my mother. And um, there are many stories out there. And when I was listening to the inspiration of your mother, the impact on your life, I was also thinking that of the many stories I know, sometimes that is not the case for some people. Um, and I was thinking, uh, that in these uh, instances, often it is the love of somebody else that steps in and is of inspiration. And this is what we do for each other, that we can give that kind of powerful love as well as what you talked about so lovingly about your own mother. And, and Jim, I see you in the 14 plus years that I've worked at HCAM TV in a way providing that for community in the way you look after uh, and care so deeply about community and provide the programming to look after uh, us, the people in town and viewers beyond as well with uh, your deep care for people being connected as community. So, thank you, Cheryl. Um, it, it's an honor to work with you. It's, uh, it's an honor. Well, thank you too. And that is our program and it was amazing. And there were 10 amazing storytellers with your stories. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for the viewers who were, who were here and hanging in. I apologize for being late. Um, we're still, I'm still getting the hang of this. So um, uh, that is my own planning to work on, but uh, uh, I'm so thrilled that I had 10 stories to share with you and, and these extraordinary stories from different places and walks of life, stories of life. Think about the stories that you might have to share for future shows. Our next program will be the first Friday night of April. And the theme is every day is Earth Day for April as well. So stories about the natural world. I'm looking forward to it. And we will be sharing information on HCAM TV website. And I just want to say, keep listening and telling your stories and for us all to feel the connection as we give and take stories in our life. Thank you all so very much and have a good weekend.